Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's evening lecture. Uh, and I know many of you out there may be a little tired. It's midterm week, and uh, but I think this will be a really great lecture to, after the stress of midterms to um, join us in welcoming uh, David Benjamin. And his lecture is entitled Black Box. Um, David Benjamin is the founding principal of the living. Um, I first came into contact with David's work when I was teaching an applied studies seminar here um, at SciArc with Ramiro Diaz Granados. And the seminar was called Recasting the Rustic. And we were looking at ways that organic material, um, biological matter could be integrated with architectural form and how this could change the way that we think about very conventional things uh, such as Vitruvian ideas of fermitas. What does it mean for a work of architecture to be stable, permanent, solid? What happens when we begin to incorporate things that question that very solidity and that make us rethink architecture's capacity uh, to collaborate with other forms of matter, even living matter, quite literally. So I, I love the name of your firm, David. Um, and our seminar examined uh, the role of the rustic specifically through the application um, of these organic construction materials, in this case mycelium, which is a fungal uh, material, in order to reduce environmental impact and integrate these aspects into the idea of the building life cycle. Um, and the projects that the students here at SIRC were doing focused on the use of this biodegradable material, um, growing it and cultivating it to produce uh, kind of unorthodox tiles for construction. And so a primary example and inspiration for us, um, of course, was uh, the Living's PS1 project, um, the Hi-Fi Tower, uh, that was constructed at PS1, a really impressive work of a 13 meter high tower, um, custom made with compostable bricks. Um, the bricks were literally returned to um, the community gardens uh, as uh, soil, as uh, compost for them, which was kind of amazing to us because we were thinking how could architecture, how could you design as an architect um, for a building or a project or a structure that would have uh, different forms of life in a span of time that you as the designer could actually bear witness to, as opposed to something that you know, becomes a ruin over, over hundreds of years. Um, so for us, this was a really extremely important project um, that inspired a lot of the work that came out of the seminar. Um, and I think I really look forward to seeing uh, David's whole body of work and, and some of the other projects that I think raise these questions in different ways, not always uh, literally with, the, um, with organic matter, but also in terms of uh, algorithmic work and how computation uh, can also be used to um, engender some of these effects of fluctuating uh, architecture. Um, so David is, the, as I said, the founding principal of the living and his assistant professor at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. He and the firm have won many design prizes, including the Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League, the New Practices Award from the AIA in New York, the Young Architects Program Award for the Museum of Modern Art in PS1, as well as a Wholesome uh, St Sustainability Award. His clients include a very impressive list, the City of New York, the sole municipal government, Google, Nike, 3M, Airbus, BMW, the Miami Science Museum, and Bjork. It's a very list there. Um, recent projects include the Princeton Embodied Computation Lab, which is a new building for research on next generation architecture technologies that I'm hoping we'll see tonight. Um, pier 35 Eco Park, which is a 200 long floating pier in the East River that changes color according to water quality. And the um, aforementioned Hi-Fi, the branching tower at MoMA PS1. The Living combines research and practice, exploring new ideas and technologies through prototyping. The studio's work embraces complexity at the intersection of ideas, technologies, materials, culture, humans, non-humans, as well as the environment. Focusing on the intersection of biology, computation, and design, 
The studio has articulated three frameworks for harnessing living organisms for architecture. And these are biocomputing, biosensing, and biomanufacturing. The studio welcomes rapid change, embraces design with uncertainty, and develops rules rather than forms, and designs with unknowable forces. So with that, I would like to ask you to welcome me in joining David Benjamin, uh, welcoming to SciArc. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here, especially during midterm time. Um, by the way, it sounds like a fascinating seminar. I'd like to learn more about the seminar that you mentioned. Um, but it's a particular pleasure for me to be at SciArc, um, where I've always kind of felt uh, an affinity for the kind of adventurousness, ambitiousness, and experimental nature of the uh, design and research. Um, so today I want to kind of um, talk about a method of practice um, that we've developed at The Living um, that maybe starts with the idea that buildings and cities uh, could be considered living, breathing organisms. Uh, we think that uh, it's interesting and productive to imagine them to have metabolisms and to live in complex ecosystems with interconnected loops of ideas, technologies, materials, politics, culture, humans, non-humans, and the natural environment. Um, and in this sense, you know, we could consider each one of those players to be a, a loop in this kind of interconnected ecosystem. And maybe um, each loop um, doesn't really have its full meaning when considered alone. Or to put it another way, each loop kind of gains its traction and its meaning through its interconnections. Um, so we could also think of the loops as projects. And in this sense, each project and our collective projects by that I mean the collective projects of our studio, The Living, but maybe our collective projects as a discipline, all of our projects together, maybe those also only make uh, a certain amount of sense through their interconnections. Um, and maybe also each topic of research, each obsession, uh, only makes sense uh, through its interconnections to other topics, to, to other... Um, uh, people's research and obsessions. And so in this context, um, tonight I would like to focus on these kind of three areas of our own practice um, that we believe are interconnected and that have a kind of feedback. And these areas are research, books, and buildings. Um, so I'll start with research, and to give you a little bit of a flavor, I'll, I'll describe how over the past several years, we've been exploring prototypes for bringing architecture to life through a variety of digital technologies. So we've created projects like this, a kind of glass that breathes in response to people, combining sensors and information. Uh, this is a project called Living City. We've created a facade that glows and blinks according to air quality and human interest in the environment. In this case, we're combining environment and public space in the city of Seoul, South Korea. We've created uh, a wall that displays real-time social media graffiti, combining a version of robotics with uh, public debate. Um, and this is a kind of exploration of how robotics could be a little bit less top-down and a little bit more bottom-up and emergent, um, drawing these pictures that emerge over time and are not predetermined but respond to real-time uh, social media feeds. And we've even created this, um, soup bowls that reveal uh, secret messages in street food stalls. Here we're combining street culture and critical discourse, and we're using some uh, aspects of a design palette that include humor and surprise. And that was for a Biennale in Shenzhen in Hong Kong. Uh, so more recently, we've been adding to this design ecosystem, adding to our design palette by designing with actual living uh, systems. 
Uh, in this case, we were exploring an air filtering facade with the self-sustaining ecosystem of frogs, uh, algae, snails, and this is a project that was experimental. It was for a biennale um, and an exhibit at the uh, 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 Chicago um, School of uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but it was uh, full scale and it was exploring um, what we think is a, a kind of viable um, new way to look at biology as part of a design palette. Um, so in this sense, um, a lot of our recent work and much of what I'll describe tonight involves looking at this uh, fertile intersection of architecture, computation, and biology, often with a focus on trying to uncover new possibilities for sustainability in the built environment. Um, at this point, I should note that, of course, architects have been inspired by biology for hundreds of years. You know, we all know this famous book uh, by Darcy Wentworth Thompson. But I'd like to argue that um, biology of today is very different than biology of 100 years ago. It's now possible to do things like this, grow cells in isolation on an acrylic chip instead of within a living organism. It's possible to visualize the neurons firing in a tadpole, a living tadpole, in real time through a technology called quantum dots and incredible microscope images. Um, it's possible to take a look at this, which we could never do before, which is stem cells communicating with one another and determining whether to grow into skin tissue, heart tissue, or bone tissue. Um, and in this collaboration that we've done with a biologist named Lars Dietrich at Columbia, we've been studying the way bacteria grow in biofilms with very complex three-dimensional shapes, and we've been applying some of the latest techniques of computation, such as computer vision and machine learning, to try to encapsulate that complexity, um, the way this complex 3D form materializes in the world, to encapsulate that in a kind of computer model with the idea that maybe that could be the start of designing with it. Um, so despite um, this kind of research and uh, close collaboration with some biologists, um, I should note that uh, I feel like the more I learn about biology, the more we learn today and collectively about biology, the more we see how complex it is um, and how much we still have to learn about it. And it's in this sense that I think, and I'm going to kind of argue a little bit in this talk, that design with biology may involve design with a black box, design with forces beyond our control, design with uncertainty, and a kind of new approach to design that is less about a kind of top-down precision and more about a responsive, adaptive, kind of emergent condition. Um, more specifically, I'm going to describe three approaches that were already mentioned tonight um, that we've been exploring that we think are, are pretty interesting for this new context, this new century of biology, this new approach to design with uncertainty and design with black boxes. And I'm going to describe each approach here and give one example project for each approach. The first approach is biocomputing. This project involved using actual living organisms as a kind of uh, processing tool to compute something about the physical world um, and use that to help solve a human problem. For example, uh, reducing carbon emissions in transportation. And we applied this approach to the design of a new airplane part for the airplane manufacturer Airbus. Um, the idea was that maybe we could use a new approach to design for the 21st century, you know, kind of move beyond the engineering paradigm of the 20th century, which brought us air travel as we know it today. Um, we could move beyond that through the use of 
kind of bio computing to design new airplanes. But uh, we wanted to start um, small so that we could actually prototype it. So we started with this component shown in red here called a partition. A partition, as you probably know from this image, is the dividing wall between the seating area of an airplane and the galley. Um, and like all components in an airplane, especially ones that um, touch where humans are uh, traveling, um, this component has to undergo very strict um, certification processes, including this so-called 16G crash test. And you can get a sense by watching this crash test of the existing partition um, of how much force this uh, component has to resist. You know, just as you watch the movement of those crash test dummies when they're accelerating in four tenths of a second um, to the force of uh, 16 times gravity. Um, and this component, the partition in an airplane, while it looks uh, pretty boring and forgettable, it was actually selected by Airbus because it's very challenging to design in a lightweight way. Um, in other words, this component can only attach to the fuselage, the airplane's main structure, at four points, two on the top and two on the bottom. The component can only be one inch thick. The component has to hold this fold-down seat, which you saw on the previous slide, um, you know, that cabin attendants are seated on, and that creates a very asymmetrical load because the seat is hanging off of one side. And on top of that, according to recent regulations, a partition has to have what's called a stretcher flap, which is this inset shape here uh, where uh, you have to be able to take an injured passenger from the seating area, put them on a stretcher, bring them around the corner out to the door, and to do that and get the turning radius you need, you need to be able to remove this part of the partition. That's a challenge because according to human intuition and rules of thumb, that area that you have to remove is exactly where you'd want to put some cross bracing. So for all of these reasons, it's a difficult component to design in a lightweight way. And it's here that we turn to a kind of new way of looking at the problem. And more specifically, we turn to the process of growth of the living organism called physarum, also known as slime mold. So physarum grows in networks that are uh, efficient and redundant. So they start out in this kind of center point that you see in yellow. They're growing out to reach sources of food, which are these white dots, and they create a kind of network of links between the dots that's efficient and redundant. It's efficient because it uses a small amount of material or a small amount of lines to connect the dots, and it's redundant because you can remove many of the lines individually, and the system as a whole can route around the problem. And so when we started looking at partition designs, we thought that maybe um, this kind of efficient and redundant network would be a good way to compute a solution to a partition, the structure for a partition. So we uh, created an algorithm based on the slime mold growth that would start with a very dense network of lines and slowly remove the ones that were less necessary, reinforce the ones that were more necessary, and create a pretty complex network that's connecting the dots of a partition, which mean connecting to the points where it's attached to the fuselage, connecting to the points where it's holding the fold down cabin attendant seats. Um, at this point, when we had an algorithm that was based on uh, this natural growth process, we turn to a kind of version of artificial evolution, you know, sometimes uh, known as genetic algorithms or evolutionary computing, to generate, evaluate, and evolve literally thousands of design options. Um, each one was a complex adaptive network. Some of them were better than others at solving the problem. Um, the idea was to explore a very wide design space of possible options and uncover solutions that are beyond a kind of human intuition and human rule of thumb, human linear thinking. So in this kind of data analysis, we're looking at 10,000 data points. Each data point is a possible partition design using different techniques of data visualization and kind of number crunching or uh, data analysis to uncover a set of designs that are really good at reaching this uh, or getting close to the zero, zero point where that means 
low weight on the x-axis, low displacement under structural load on the y-axis, and you can see a kind of trade-off curve between being really good at one and less good at the other, and vice versa, or being kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, the important thing to note is that this is a technique that uncovers a lot of possibilities that we think can kind of enhance the human designer's ability to um, discover new possibilities. Um, so this was not only a kind of theoretical um, exploration, we actually intend, intended at this point to build uh, a partition and test it. And at this point, we decided to use a kind of condition of a lot of natural systems, which is run it again at a different scale. And so as you see on the left, we have the kind of problem set up, the outline of the partition, all of the dots that we need to connect. In the middle, we have one example of a network of crisscrossing black lines that create a structure for a partition wall. But then on the right, you see that each black line can in turn be made of hundreds of tiny red lines. So it's a kind of multi-scalar operation. So here, zooming in, you can see it again. Instead of making the black bars out of tubes or solid material, we make them out of a, a kind of lattice of tiny bars where each tiny bar can be sized at a different diameter according to how strong it needs to be. It's kind of like bone growth, where bone gets denser in some areas and more porous in other areas. Um, so like many of our projects, we were aiming in this, in this case to kind of push the limits of some new technologies, see what might be possible with biocomputation and um, this kind of process of artificial evolution, but also create it, make it, bring it into the real world with today's techniques, technologies, and equipment. Um, so we use some kind of advanced metal 3D printing, um, a new alloy that Airbus has invented that's uh, good at uh, 3D printing lightweight airplane parts, and kind of combined this operation of a, a new uh, type of advanced design, a new type of advanced fabrication, a new material, um, to create a partition um, that was significantly different than the partition that's flying today, um, that's higher performance in some measurements, including it's about 50% lighter than the existing partition and even a little bit stronger, um, but most essentially that we built um, and are currently testing and certifying to fly in today's existing airplanes. So it's that combination of kind of reaching far into the future for possibilities, but grounding them into what could operate with today's constraints that defines a lot of our uh, work and research. Two, biosensing. So by this I mean using living organisms as um, detectors of certain conditions in their environment uh, with the ability to respond accordingly. Uh, for example, in order to detect environmental quality and make that legible to humans and to the public. So this project started with a prototype in the East River of New York City with this floating network of lights. Um, each light was actually a transparent tube that was half underwater and half above water. Underwater, we had a variety of sensors. Above water, we had a dynamic uh, set of lights. Um, in our initial prototype, this was made of electronics, digital sensors, the kind of material of the Internet of Things, we now call it. But recently, we've been exploring adding to that design palette living organisms. And more specifically, I mean adding mussels, you know, the shellfish mussels. Um, and it turns out that mussels, as you can see in this sped up video, open and close their shells uh, as part of their normal metabolism. Uh, they're basically breathing dissolved oxygen underwater. And you can see here that they're kind of pulsing around. They're not moving far from where they're based, but they're opening and closing their shells, and that's why you see that movement. Um, and it turns out that the rate and the amount that muscles open and close their shells is an incredibly sensitive and sophisticated detector of water pollution. And that allows us to take a living muscle, 
glue to one side of its shell uh, an inexpensive magnet, glue to the other side of the shell a Hall effect sensor, which you can get for about $2. A Hall effect sensor is just sensing magnetic field. And in this way, you can kind of harness the natural metabolism of a living organism um, to be a better sensor of water pollution for about $2 worth of components than a $10,000 dissolved oxygen sensor. So this was valuable to us because we didn't have a big budget for the project, but more than that, we think it points to a really interesting direction for the future of design, which is to combine artificial intelligence with natural intelligence. In other words, to combine the best computation has to offer, the holy grail of AI, with a kind of uh, natural intelligence, a biological intelligence, a living intelligence that has kind of been there all along and we may have overlooked it in our obsession for a certain kind of technology, um, but that in some cases has evolved over millions of years to do very sophisticated computing, if you could call it that. And this combination of using kind of the best of the computer and the best of the living natural world uh, we think is a, is a really interesting territory for a variety of projects beyond the one that we are exploring now. Um, this project that we're creating now, um, we did a test installation a couple of years ago. We installed it in the East River, and here you can see it communicating uh, real-time water quality to the public in the context of other lighting in the city. So, for example, in the upper left, you see the Empire State Building. That's dynamic lighting in the city. It changes once a day. It shows things like holidays and Mariah Carey concerts. And down on the lower right, you see a, a different kind of lighting in the city that's changing more than once a second. It's displaying invisible conditions of the environment, like water quality, like presence of fish. And the kind of proposal, even though it's a very small installation, is that we're, we're prototyping the possible future building envelopes uh, of the city, a kind of public display of information that could be on our, on our buildings, on our facades, as part of our skyline um, in, in the way we occupy the city. So here's a, a video of uh, the early test installation. You see a kind of tipping point in the data and the lights um, change colors because the water quality is, uh, uh, it goes from being worse than a week ago to better than a week ago. Um, and in this kind of spirit of our prototypes, our research, our experiments and what's possible for the future of of architecture in the built environment. This small scale prototype has since grown into a bigger commission by the city of New York to make a 200 foot long floating pier of dynamic lights um, that at this point looks like it will go into construction uh, late next summer. Um, so that's another example of a way we're kind of pushing um, some possible new technologies, some possible new framings of design um, and trying to ground them in what we can create today. Three, biomanufacturing. By this I mean using living organisms as tiny factories to generate, to basically manufacture the building blocks of our buildings and cities. Um, and uh, as we heard before, this was uh, an idea about the use of mycelium materials, it was a proposal originally, a kind of competition entry for the MoMA PS1 Young Architects uh, Program competition. And I'm gonna show a, a short video that we created as our kind of imagination of what could be when we were trying to win the competition. <laughs> 
So th this project is called Hi-Fi, and our idea was to explore a new kind of building material, a new kind of building block that could in turn suggest new ways to, to think about the built environment. Um, in some ways, we thought of the project as growing out of the Earth's uh, natural carbon cycle. This is the kind of endless loop of growth and decay and regrowth. And more specifically, we were interested in the possibility of maybe starting with low value raw material, like starting with waste shown in the center instead of starting with plants shown on the left. Maybe spending very little energy to convert raw material into building blocks rather than what we normally do, spend a lot of energy converting raw material into building blocks. Then making a building, a useful building, and at the end of the useful life of that building, returning all of that matter, all of that physical stuff to the carbon cycle instead of having that physical stuff, that matter, sit in a landfill for hundreds or even thousands of years. So another way of uh, describing it would be to temporarily borrow from the carbon cycle and return back to the carbon cycle as we think about how we would uh, make our built environment. Um, sounds far-fetched, and, and of course it is a little far-fetched, um, but our kind of uh, insight here was, again, a living organism, and this is a microscope video of mycelium growing in kind of branching root-like structures. So this is a, a part of fungi, a part of mushrooms, and you can see how it kind of grows. It has a certain logic. Um, it's very interesting formally, but actually we were less interested in the form than the uh, potential for this material to be a kind of glue, a kind of binding, um, because uh, you can take mycelium, combine it with agricultural waste, not the high value part of agriculture, so in this case, not corn kernels that could be eaten, uh, but just the waste of agriculture, a corn stover, which is the chopped up corn stalks and husks. And you combine them together, as you can see here in this sped up video, in about five days it grows into a solid object uh, in almost any shape that you can create a mold for. And uh, this is a line of research that had been going on for a couple of years by the time we discovered it, and I think there's more interesting stuff that's come since we've used it. But our idea at the time was to take this material uh, and create a building block for architecture, to create a new kind of brick. And that hadn't quite been done before. People were using this material for packaging, uh, they had other possible uses for it, um, but there hadn't been an example of large-scale, outdoor, structural use of this material at um, a kind of big or at least medium scale. Um, so uh, we set about um, trying to test that, and in order to test that idea, we had to do a lot of physical testing. Here we were working in a strength of materials lab at Columbia University, testing the compressive strength of a single brick, testing the strength and performance of a small assembly of bricks. And we were doing this partly as research, but also partly out of the kind of practical need um, to make a structure out of the material. Um, because, and it seems obvious now, but it was a, a funny moment of revelation, our structural engineers at Arup, a great collaborator on the project, um, told us that if they were going to do the structural simulations for the project, they would need to put this form in the computer um, and specify the material, and they very quickly discovered that there's no drop-down menu item for mushroom brick in their s software. So we had to do this physical testing in order to create a custom material profile in order to do the simulation and uh, kind of engage the normal part of architectural design. Um, on the first iteration, we had these red areas, which meant that the structure would move by 30 inches or more under hurricane force winds. Um, but over time, as we designed simultaneously at the scale of the material, we were changing the ingredients that we were feeding into one of these molds. 
Uh, we were designing at the scale of the brick, changing the shape of the brick, and also simultaneously designing the overall massing, the form of the building, in order to gradually improve the performance and get into a, a kind of realm where everyone thought uh, we had a safe structure. Um, another thing we realized about the material is that it's very different on the outside than the inside. And for us, this meant that we wouldn't be able to create a complex macro 3D shape. We wouldn't be able to create a complex massing by cutting the material on site the way you can do with some materials. And this led us to another part of the design process, which was creating a kind of micro algorithm, a, a subset of the design system where we were trying to solve two problems at once. The problems were a fitting problem because every course of bricks was a different length. So the question was, how would you create a system where you could fit uh, a kind of fixed number of sizes of bricks in um, every course of different length? And the second problem we had was a stacking problem because we needed a system that would ensure that every brick rested properly on two bricks below it with two inches of overlap on each brick below it. And that was a problem that was easy to realize we had to achieve, easy to describe, but hard to execute when we had 10,000 bricks in a structure that was a semi-complex shape. So we used computation, kind of wrote custom uh, algorithms in order to solve this problem. Um, when we arrived on site, we had three weeks to build the structure. Um, and we had figured out a lot. We had been um, doing a lot of research, but I think by design, uh, MoMA PS1 wants you to um, be challenged all the way up until the end. So it was a short time frame in each of the phases. And at this point, um, one of the things that was, that was interesting to me is that within our design ecosystem, we combined a kind of um, material which we could call like expertise or knowledge or creativity. In other words, we had Columbia University grad students who knew a lot about form and computation and computer programs. We had New York City brick masons who know a lot about stacking objects. Um, neither one had made something like this before out of this material. And so into this kind of complex design ecosystem, we had not only a, a new material, not only a living organism, not only a process of computation, but this kind of human element of labor, expertise, and, and, and problem solving that was really interesting to see um, play out. And here I should note that everyone who worked on the project was paid fairly, which is not always the case with these PS1 installations. Um, and, and I'm saying that, you know, not only to, you know, add a, f a relevant footnote, but also to say that this kind of thing is important to our design ecosystem as well. You know, we're thinking not only about the material scale, not only about different methods of design, not only about a bottom line result in terms of reducing waste and carbon emissions, but we're thinking about how a new process, a new technology, a new material might engage things like labor, expertise, fairness. Um, and in the end, um, we were able to construct what I think of as a kind of medium scale test of this idea. So it was a structure that was about 40 feet tall, made out of about 10,000 bricks. Here you can see it in the context of the glass and steel buildings of Manhattan in the background and the traditional clay brick buildings of MoMA PS1. It was a structure that um, seemed at once kind of familiar, but also um, strangely new. And it was a structure that we were interested in exploring, not only for the technical performance of the materials, although that was certainly important, but also maybe for the atmospheric capacity of the materials or the creative capacity. You know, what would it be like to stand inside a building made out of this material? What would be the qualities of light and shadow and texture um, on this material? Um, what would be the kind of experience of foreground to background? How would it frame the natural environment? What would it feel like and smell like even? Um, but of course, the ultimate test of any PS1 project is its ability to host a party. And this was the first Saturday of, of that summer uh, and the kind of thrilling but terrifying moment 
when 5,000 people uh, came into the courtyard to hear electronic music and they were touching our structure and crawling on it and climbing on it even though the museum promised they wouldn't do that. And it was, um, you know, kind of uh, scary for us to have this, um, this level of interaction and have this test for the, the structure and the material. But at the same time, we wouldn't have wanted it any other way. In other words, it was entirely fitting for us for this test to be out in public, out in society, out in culture, um, with interaction by the public that we couldn't exactly script or control or contain um, in a way that we could learn about the material. And you know, by contrast, a lot of tests of new ideas and new materials are done either on the lab bench or in architecture on a kind of fenced off area of a construction site to do a facade mock-up. And you know, we liked the idea that this would be done out in public. Um, so a couple of final notes about this project. Um, one thing that we thought could be interesting is to explore a kind of local materials um, in the sense of the actual physical stuff, not necessarily the building culture, but the physical stuff. In other words, just the way sometimes people think of local food, um, where food miles are important, where they're measuring how far food comes from, from you know, where it's produced to where it's consumed. We think this could be an interesting idea to explore for architecture. And in this case, um, almost all of the physical stuff, you know, the, the um, agricultural waste uh, came from within 150 miles radius of the site. The production facility, the factory where we grew the bricks with our partner Ecovative um, was within 150 miles. Um, you know, we built this structure in New York City, of course, and then at the end of the life cycle, we transitioned that material by composting into another material and that new material also was um, you know, just a couple of miles away, so very close and local. Um, unlike some uh, MoMA PS1 projects, uh, our work was, was not done after construction was done. In fact, we went back um, at the closing of the summer and disassembled the structure, took all of the bricks, crumbled them into smaller pieces, combined them with yet another living organism, bacteria and worms. And within about 60 days, all of the matter, all of the physical stuff of the building returned to soil. Um, in fact, high quality soil that could be used for New York City tree planting, but also for community gardens, which in turn was growing new food. And that's a kind of um, register of how um, uh, untoxic the whole process was and the material was. You know, you could use that physical stuff that we made a building out of um, almost to eat, basically, because you're then turning that physical stuff back into food. Um, again, we're looking for a kind of deeper insight or a bigger idea for the project, and this is one that we were kind of left with, and that's that maybe, you know, as, as architects and other designers, we should think about designing to disappear as much as we typically think about designing to appear. And that um, kind of idea, we think, could both be, um, it could lead to new um, measurements of sustainability, new ideas for sustainability, but also we think could unlock new creative uh, possibilities for architecture. Okay, so, um, now I want to quickly describe um, two other loops that we were kind of working on at the same time. And, you know, so what I've just described is, you know, what could be fit into a kind of category of research, although the boundaries are kind of messy. Um, and at the same time we were working on this, we were also working on books and buildings. And I'll describe those both, you know, very briefly, not in the same detail as the research. Um, but. I think it's worth noting that books um, operate on a kind of different register um, than most projects. Uh, they kind of give us a different perspective. They involve a different kind of thinking, a different kind of design. 
they move at a different pace. And uh, we were working on two books at the, at the same time as some of these projects. And I wanna just give you a, a little bit of a flavor of what we were thinking about in those books. And, and both of these books uh, are coming out very soon. Uh, the first one is a book called Embodied Energy and Design, Making Architecture Between Metrics and Narratives. Um, this is, uh, is just about to be published by Lars Mueller Publishers, so in fall 2017. Um, and the, the kind of concept of this book starts with the fact that buildings, you know, we know these statistics, but I'm gonna repeat them. Buildings account for about a third of global waste, uh, about a third of global energy consumption, and about a third of global carbon emissions. Um, but lesser known is that if we look at um, total energy use in buildings, it turns out that embodied energy, which is related to the project I just showed, and embodied energy is basically defined as uh, the energy required to extract, produce, transport, and assemble materials into a building. So it's kind of hard to calculate, like carbon footprint, but it is measurable. Um, and it's a kind of uh, important but invisible feature of our built environment. How much embodied energy did it take to make this building or to make a phone or a laptop? Um, so what most people don't realize is that embodied energy has been increasing over time uh, as a proportion of total energy. In other words, total energy in architecture is made up of operational energy and embodied energy. Operational energy is like heating, lighting, cooling and embodied energy I just described, the energy that goes into the materials. Well, the, over time, in just the past you know, 40 or 50 years, um, operational energy has decreased and embodied energy has increased quite a bit. And in fact, um, you may not be able to read the fine print here, but on the left is a startling graphic um, by one of the contributors to this uh, book that I edited. And it basically describes a United Nations uh, uh, report that says that by 2050, um, a third of global carbon emissions, which is very connected to global energy consumption, a third of global carbon emissions will come from making the materials of our architecture and infrastructure. That's global carbon emissions. That includes cars, airplanes, manufacturing, everything, and a third of it is just due to all of the stuff, to the processes and the energy that go into making our physical stuff. So in other words, uh, embodied energy is this kind of invisible, somewhat underexplored, but important topic uh, for the future of architecture and maybe for the future of the planet. Um, but part of my point here is that the book allowed us to explore the topic um, first through um, some drawings through some design because after all we're architects and we were thinking um, how, do, how do you engage this urgent topic of embodied energy? Um, it should somehow intersect with the design process and we started to try to draw embodied energy. So we made these data visualizations of how much embodied energy there is in different kinds of material, aluminum, wood, concrete, etc. Um, we broke down embodied energy into different processes, you know, envelope, structure, site work, et cetera. Uh, we looked at some case studies um, comparing uh, embodied energy and embodied carbon in different types of buildings. Um, but we also realized as we were doing this kind of analysis of data and metrics that it was important but insufficient. Um, so just thinking about the numbers was not enough. And at that point, we had the idea to start drawing what we called material stories. So that was drawing a kind of narrative of the story of a material like concrete or steel or wood, all the way from those processes I was describing, from extracting raw materials from the earth or mining, um, to transportation, to factory production that might include smelting or mixing. Um, uh, that might include cutting and trimming. And we thought that this, in the end, uh, by drawing the material stories, was an important but sometimes overlooked aspect of the whole issue. So there's a lot of engineering work on embodied energy, 
but it typically involves just the numbers. And we think to really gain traction, to get anywhere on addressing this problem on how architects use materials, how they understand materials, we might have to start bringing it into the process of design and inventing new kinds of drawings to understand it and work with it. Um, so the second book that we've been working on is uh, basically, I guess you could call it a monograph of our, of our practice. Um, and this is a book that we're calling Now We See Now, and it's going to be published by the Monticelli Press in uh, next spring, spring 2018. And, you know, I won't go into the details of this book except to say that it has allowed us to kind of sharpen our thinking about what we're doing when we're day-to-day -day just kind of doing our research, making our projects, working for our clients. Um, and more specifically, um, we've divided the book into two uh, important and interconnected volumes. So the first volume is about projects. Um, so here's just one example of a project. This is um, uh, a, a project that we created with the musician Bjork to create a kind of immersive experience for her retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so the first part is projects and the second part is research. And we think of them as these kind of interconnected loops, of course, like my theme, um, but as two really important uh, kind of factors and areas of, of our effort in our design studio. So the projects, you know, I think, you know, you might imagine as kind of typical representation um, and the research projects I'll, I'll, I'll show in a second. But so, you know, to give an example of a project, we're kind of showing a little bit about our process um, over time, thinking about how to create um, this immersive experience in collaboration with a musician who uh, authored a song, with a filmmaker who created a, you know, really interesting uh, music video. And then we were the third party creating a physical space, a room. Um, this was interesting for us because in the end we were creating a kind of architecture to create a mood, architecture for just a single use, for a single song to be listened to. Uh, we started with a map of the song, a 2D map, and kind of projected that to the ceiling and walls of a room, and then gradually brought in a kind of material, a sound dampening material of felt, um, to create a, a kind of enclosure um, in which to experience this song. It turned out that by mapping the song onto the room, every second of the song corresponded to an inch of the room. And in a way, we were creating kind of physical representation of the song um, that played out as something that had this kind of hybrid quality of a little bit digital, um, a little bit organic and raw. Um, most essentially, it was a, a physical space that dampened the sound um, so that 40 different loudspeakers could all play a unique mix. Each loudspeaker played a different mix of the song, so that it was a very uh, physical way to experience the song by moving around in the room. Um, and uh, it, it was um, uh, a space that kind of gave you a different experience by being in. And we liked kind of working on that atmospheric uh, uh, kind of register for architecture. In fact, we, we felt um, uh, very kind of pleased when Bjork went into the space and said something like, the room is so quiet, because that had been a, a kind of requirement of the, of the room to dampen all the sound. She said, it was so quiet, you can hear your body living. And we thought, okay, that's, that's kind of um, using some of these kind of design approaches, using materials, fabrication to achieve this kind of experience, um, you know, which maybe I'm making the point to say that is, is part of our design palette as well, not just the technical stuff, um, but the more atmospheric stuff. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, the flip side of the book is these research projects, which um, are basically um, uh, excerpted vision, versions, most of them, of um, 
peer-reviewed research papers that we wrote about our process as we designed some of these things. So um, this is an example of a research project um, related to the use of muscles as biosensors that I described before. Um, what's important, I'm not gonna describe the details of the paper, but it's, it's a way for us to kind of um, get under the hood um, to show people the process as much as the product, um, to show our methods with the notion that others might be able to critique them or um, repeat them or build off of them and take them in their own directions. Um, in this case, we're showing some of the details of how we set up these muscle sensors in case other people might want to do that. We're showing some of the data um, that we got from two different sites comparing uh, sensors on the muscles for their valve gape, but also their heartbeat rate, and also comparing that to some digital sensor data. And so we're kind of offering back that, you know, one way of making architectural projects could be to expose the data, expose the methods. Um, and that for us, that's um, an important kind of flip side uh, for, the, for the, the projects and the studio method. Um, so it's in that sense that, you know, maybe this book is, less of a typical monograph with kind of glossy photographs of finished work and more of really a kind of field guide um, that will help um, generate new work, you know, where this is just the beginning. Um, and finally, and I'll, I'll show these um, fairly quickly, but I wanna make the point that um, uh, an important element in our studio mission and our studio work is buildings. Um, and while we are experimental as a practice, while we're exploring and trying to push the limits of what architecture is, um, while we believe that architecture does not need to involve only static, solitary, inert buildings dug into a single site, in other words, architecture might expand more in space and time than we typically think. Um, it might start earlier with the extraction of materials from the ground. It might end later with um, landfills or composting. Um, it might actually involve different sites, even though the building is only made in one site. Um, maybe as architects, we could design some of the other sites where architecture comes into being. Um, including designing the labor involved in producing architecture and uh, designing fair practices or specifying those. Um, you know, so while we believe all those things, which, you know, would lead you to the conclusion that we're kind of challenging the building, we're, we're maybe trying to overturn the idea of the building, um, we're still very interested in creating buildings and what the possibilities for buildings might be. Um, so it's in that context that I wanna show um, two projects that we designed that recently completed construction. Um, one of them is an office space. It's a kind of automated office space design, and this is a new office space for 300 people uh, in Toronto. And this is a, a, just like a two or three minute video we created to describe the process. And it was really a, an experiment in maybe a new process of design that's in some ways similar to what we used for the Airbus project that I described. So the process started with these high level goals and constraints. We had, you know, three floors of an existing building. We had to fit a certain amount of meeting rooms. We had to fit a certain amount of people. And then we defined some of the goals of what would make a good office space. We came up with six factors. Um, and then we created a system that would allow us to explore many, many design options, you know, based on these kind of high level uh, definitions. So the steps were basically first, we very deliberately, creatively um, created a geometric system. So here's a typical floor plate. Uh, we created these red lines, which are subdividing the space into different regions, which we called neighborhoods. There are a few input parameters that can uh, create more or less points, which mean more or less neighborhoods, shift those points, which in turn will allow the boundaries between those neighborhoods to shift. Um, and we basically get a kind of generative geometric system, which allows for a lot of different floor plan layouts. 
Then we designed and uh, deliberately created um, six different goals. One of them, actually two of them were based uh, directly on human input, on human experience that's not normally rated or scored. We asked every person what did they want to be near in terms of other teams and equipment. We asked every person what kind of work environment do they want. And those were the two goals. Any floor plan we could measure for how well it was meeting those criteria. We also measured things like buzz, you know, where are the areas of a lot of activity and do we have enough of those and are they spread out? We measured daylight, we measured distraction, you know, of all the people sitting at desks, are they gonna be distracted in a given floor plate design by people walking by? And finally, we measured views to the outside. So in this space, we thought it was gonna be important to have views to the outside, even if you didn't have direct daylight. Here we use the power of automated computation that's very similar to what I showed for Airbus, and we generated literally 10,000 design options. And here again, each uh, point is a design option. We can color code them according to certain types of uh, design solutions. We can rank them according to their scores for the different goals. Since we have six different goals, it's a six-dimensional problem. It's not as simple as the two-dimensional problem for an airplane part that's lightweight. Um, but we can still use these techniques of generating possible designs, bringing them back to the table the way a normal architecture process would bring you know, two or three design options to the stakeholders. And we think, um, having, uh, allowing us to have a very kind of data-informed debate about values, judgment, um, and what is right for the space. In other words, I think you, you've probably sensed me arguing through this, this process that this kind of automation and computation, I think, can empower uh, architects and decision makers as opposed to replacing them or handicapping them or making them victim to a kind of inevitable um, rule of the computer. Um, so this is a kind of experiment that we were interested in pushing in an actual built project. So um, we used this process for the design. We created basically the schematic design through this uh, automated process of generative design. And then we actually um, constructed the space. And it's just opened uh, this month. Um, some of the photos still have the photographer's watermark. That's how new it is. Um, and, you know, in essence, it gave us the ability to create, uh, to kind of manage a lot of complexity and create a space that was more customized, that knew in finer level of resolution what everyone wanted and how the space was scoring and whether we were um, delivering that or not and where we were making the trade-offs. We're not pretending there don't have to be trade-offs made, um, but we're, we're allowing people to actively decide how to make those trade-offs between competing goals. And finally, the last thing I'll show tonight um, is another project that we just completed. And um, this is basically what uh, I describe as an open source building. Uh, so that's the kind of idea and the experiment of the project. Um, you know, more practically speaking, it's a new building for Princeton University, for their School of Architecture, but also their School of Art and the School of Engineering, for research on robotics, sensors, and what they're thinking of as everywhere that computing gets physicalized in the world. And that's why they're calling it the embodied computation lab. So it's a place where computation gets embodied or gets physicalized in the world. Um, so if you've ever been to the Princeton campus, you know that the main architecture building is the red shape shown at the top. And the architecture lab has existed um, for many years. In fact, um, it's been the site of a lot of architectural experimentation in the past, including Buckminster Fuller's first geosphere and some pioneering work on energy analysis and uh, environmental analysis and daylight analysis. Um, and the idea of the project was to see if we could fit, you know, 21st century research on architecture into an existing building, which was basically a converted horse stable. And we did a lot of studies and in the end um, recommended that 
uh, much of the existing stable be taken down and a new structure be constructed, but part of the building remains, um, shown as exhibition here on the right. Um, and that, you know, although there were a lot of uh, uh, programmatic requirements, our conclusion after studying a lot of different program ideas was um, that the best space um, for today's needs and the needs in five years and the needs and equipment in 20 years or 50 years, the best space was basically a big, open, flexible space. Um, and furthermore, we thought that it was important to recognize that this was a building where there was going to be research on buildings. And we thought that just as, you know, in the biology department, um, researchers use a microscope, like an electron microscope or a confocal microscope, as their instrument to learn new things. Maybe architects and engineers, when they're researching buildings, should use a building um, as their instrument. So we really designed this less as a single um, functional fixed structure and more as an evolving um, open-ended um, structure for experiments to be conducted on in full scale, kind of in real time. So another way of thinking about it is that we designed a structure that was deliberately incomplete. It was designed to be completed over time by others. So just as in open source software, you know, the author might release a certain module of software, but structure things so that others will contribute and update it and upgrade it over time. That was the idea with this building. And that specifically played out, as you can see in the uh, lower right, where we made a kind of two-thirds enclosed structure and about one-third open frame. Um, we also designed several areas where um, systems or components uh, were intended to be swapped out. So here, the heating system for the radiant floor um, on day one was coming from the waste heat of the building next door. Um, but we knew that there was a grant being proposed to create a geothermal well. And so we designed in this kind of plug and play swappable, upgradable system where you can um, switch uh, a valve basically and, uh, and get your heat from a different source. Um, there were a number of other ways we explored where the building would be almost like rewritable over time, where research by faculty and students within the building would actually be experimenting on the building on full-scale facade mock-ups, roof prototypes, um, energy harvesting from the roof, green roofs, et cetera, all kind of on-site on the building. Um, there's a number of um, embedded tiny computers, you know, which we could call sensors in the building, intended to uh, be kind of research instruments. Um, and a number of the systems, you know, although simple and although the building was fairly small and simple, um, that were kind of designed with this in mind. And you get a sense of um, some of these systems here, including this thermal image where you can see the radiant floor and the people working in the building. Um, and, you know, finally, just to note, um, there was a variety of sustainability ideas that we explored in the project, including a laminated timber frame. Um, and one of those sustainability ideas was kind of the final layer of the building, um, the facade of the building. Um, so in a way, the facade, the final layer of the building was the first research project done, you know, by the researchers in the building. And it started with um, using a waste material which is um, scaffolding boards from New York City construction. So you can see these boards here outlined in white and then you know, a close up over there. Um, New, York con City con New York City construction uses these uh, boards about two inches by 10 inches and eight feet long or 10 feet long in almost every construction site. They're typically used for a year and then literally thrown away into a landfill because of regulations, because of the risk of cracking and warping. Um, but we thought they were perfectly good as a material for a different use, for non-scaffolding material. We kind of rescued them from the landfill, uh, 960 boards, and used them, uh, started experimenting with using them as a building material. Along the way, um, we kind of were informed by some of our earlier research. We had the thought that wood, kind of like mushroom bricks, um, is a natural material. It's grown. 
It depends in its um, uh, performance on some of the conditions of growing. Each object, you know, each scaffolding board, but also each mushroom brick is slightly different from uh, the other ones. And we thought that maybe we could use that variation, experiment with that variation, rather than what we typically do with building materials, which is erase the variation or ignore it or design to a kind of common baseline. Um, more specifically, we um, developed a couple of hypotheses with the researchers in the building about how the variation of wood from one board to the next, which is, has a lot to do with the grain pattern, how maybe that could be used for some performance benefits for a facade. Um, and I won't go into the details, but the two ideas, two hypotheses were, one, as you can see on the top, if there are micro contours in wood, like where the grain exists, then maybe those can trap air and actually act as a jacket, like a parka, for a building, a kind of invisible layer of thermal insulation. You know, most buildings lose some of their heat through the contact of wind along a facade, and maybe this geometry that could happen naturally in some uh, materials like wood could provide additional thermal insulation. Maybe also the right kind of geometry that some boards could make would provide a good um, hydro effect, meaning that because of the relationship between the geometry of the board and the size of a drop of water, the building could shed water uh, more efficiently uh, you know, based on this geometry. Um, so we were very interested in exploring the variation between different materials. We were also interested in using some, experimenting with some fabrication techniques, some computation techniques, and we kind of combined that all in a kind of strange hypothesis to um, look at every board and use um, some new techniques of machine learning to detect where the knots were. So every board is different than every other board, in part because of their knots and grain patterns. So maybe we can identify the knots and grain pattern that are unique to each board. And maybe we can do that not just by hiring an intern and having them go through and circle the knots and rate the grain pattern, but by training a computer to do this for us. Um, so we started out by having a human uh, rate about 1,000 samples. Um, and we set up a, a basic website. You can see the website here, and you get the idea, right? So you see a square picture, and you click a single button. So you're not circling anything. You're not telling the computer where the knot is. You're just rating individual square photos. Well, it turns out, after just a few samples and building on the same technology that detects images for Facebook and Google, um, you can train a computer to be pretty good at not only determining whether a board has a knot or not, but also where it is. And here are a couple of views of different iterations. In this one, you can see time going from left to right. And over, over time, the system hones in on where the knot is with, with pretty good accuracy. Um, so at this point, we knew that we had a pretty good system for detecting what was unique about each board. And then we decided that we could kind of connect this to an action. So wherever we thought there was a knot, we decided to do a fabrication technique that we became interested in because it would reveal the natural properties of the board. So it was CNC, but not milling, which is uh, kind of heavy-handed, removes all aspects of the wood you know, in the determined area. But instead of CNC milling, CNC sandblasting, because sandblasting is a process that will eat away the soft areas of the wood and leave the hard areas of the wood. Um, so we train the computer to detect the knots. We built a custom CNC sandblasting machine. And the process of treating each of the boards was something like this. We would you know, kind of look at a raw board, do some first passes of um, revealing some of the features, um, and then hone in on these red lines, which is the kind of uh, tool path for where we were going to sandblast. Um, and the results you know, looked something like this. Here's our you know, software for running that that we created, a, a sandblasting machine that we created with a, 
a kind of uh, fabricator and collaborator, and in the end, um, figured a way to create a really interesting material effect, um, apply it to the facade, reveal kind of the unique story of a natural material, and I think that's my bigger point here, that materials could be thought of as being, um, having variation and we could use that variation or at least design with it and maybe use it for performance benefits. Um, and then, you know, like the other projects, we took this from a concept and some prototypes to a design for a facade and here we're using a kind of um, patterning um, across the whole south facade. And here are some of the boards installed on the building, kind of offering a unique uh, appearance an experiment in building performance, an effect that is kind of at once familiar but also strangely new in the context of uh, kind of other living materials. Um, and here are just finally a few photographs of the constructed project. Um, you know, so with that, I'll kind of just offer a few um, observations uh, at the end. Um, you know, in a way, we think of this building as a research project in itself, but maybe all buildings are uh, research projects. Um, we're interested in, you know, some of the technical possibilities um, for these kind of buildings, but um, we're also interested in things like design, atmosphere, and the experience of space. And ultimately, at least with this project, but maybe as a general uh, trend of our research, we're interested in what it feels like to live in this strange new architecture that will be occupied by humans, non-human uh, organisms, so biology and machines simultaneously. Thank you. <laughs>